Okay, that out of the way. So it's a describing an elastic collision between two bumper cars. Um, here's one car, or you can think that of them in terms of the uh, carts that you have worked with in the lab. So I have one bumper car and another bumper car. And what the problem is describing is a elastic collision between them. So this bumper car is moving at some speed of V1. So here, this would be this one, leading bumper car, V1. And this bumper car is going at speed of V2. And for this to make a physical sense, not just a mathematical sense, uh, V1 needs to be smaller than V2. And it is, it will be, <laughs> it's programmed that way. Uh, so because of V2, uh, so I said V1 is smaller than V2. V2 needs to be greater. So V2 needs to be greater than V1 so that the trailing car will catch up. They will collide and after collision, something will happen and they will go their way. All right. Um, so I, I guess we'll um, get started. So um, you should have some physical sense, uh, physical intuition for this collision. And this is one intuition we kind of need to have developed going through chapter nine, is that momentum or more precisely, total momentum is almost always conserved in collisions. There might be some exceptions, um, especially if you're leaving out interacting objects like a uh, you have a ball that's colliding with a wall and you ignore the momentum of the wall. Then sure, you have external force. It's pretty big, so momentum is not conserved. But um, as long as you, that's why I inserted the total. As long as you're looking at total momentum, uh, even when there's um, interaction with the outside bodies in a collision typically the impulse due to the force, external forces will be negligible. So you can say that total momentum is conserved. So that's one uh, starting place. So I'm hopefully it's a kind of obvious. I'm trying to use conservation law strategy because as I was saying earlier, it's so much easier if you can solve a question using conservation law. So, um, so the steps in answering question A and B is what are conserved quantities? And the discussion, I, the mini discussion we just had is getting you to say, oh, momentum is almost always going to be one of the conserved quantities in collisions one Arabic numeral. <laughs> momentum is very often going to be conserved quantity in interactions with that we choose to describe as collisions. And now you can write out, um, so you know, you don't have to do the whole thing. You can kind of look at, all right, momentum is conserved. Let me use that information and write down the conservation of momentum expression. Then what that looks like is, let me, Give the letter M for this. The initial moments, momentum is MV1 plus MV2. So conservation of momentum means this is equal to the final momentum after collision. So same as, and then this is V final one plus MV final two. And this is where I hope you realize that Oh, too many unknowns. I have two speeds that I need to figure out after the collision. And I have, I have only one equation. So that means you need to find one more equation, one more piece of information that will allow you to finish solving this question. 
So you kind of look for that and um, this is where you kind of have to know the uh, what I call physics code words. It's a very specific vocabulary. It gives you very specific and useful information about question. Here that vocabulary word is elastic collision. So you need to know what that means. It means collision that conserves kinetic energy or conserves mechanical energy. I think we usually mean kinetic energy. So we need to use conservation of energy. In this particular case, especially kinetic energy. So yeah, let's write that out. Then uh, writing this out, we have one half, um, let me erase that. And V1 squared plus one half M V2 squared is equal to M V final one, one half M V final one squared plus one half M V final two squared. And um, you just have to work through the algebra and um, let me do, uh, let me write down an expression that's more generic so that uh, you can cover this second scenario with the same equation. So the equations I've written down here, they kind of assume uh, something that's true for part A, so you can use it for part A, but it's not going to be true for part B. So um, in the interest of, of in, um, at the cost of losing some elegance, let me write in some subscripts so that I have a generally true expression. So instead of having one mass M to represent both masses, um, so in the second case, I basically just need M1 and M2. So uh, I've already started labeling one and two. So let's use this here, M1 and M2, M1 and M2. M1 and M2. So the reason I'm doing this now is because if I hadn't done this, then I would have been tempted to cancel out masses and, uh, and you can do that for part A. That's a good math practice. But for part B, you're gonna have to put those masses back in. Um, all right, uh, now some things do cancel out in both cases. This one half cancels out in all of the cases. So let me just get rid of this so that we are at least dealing with a little bit cleaner expressions. And um, this is what I like to call just math. <laughs> so once you've written down this a set of two equations and verify that, oh, um, that these two equations encode enough information for me to be able to solve for this system of equations, all the unknowns that I'm interested in, then your job as a physicist is done, but um, it is still nonetheless true that there's quite a bit of tedious algebra that um, you, are, you still need to compile it. And I do encourage you to um, uh, build up your algebra muscle, do the algebra and um, kind of um, you know, practice, practice makes perfect. <laughs> So while I do encourage that, sometimes it's uh, nice to be able to just look up the answer. For one, to see if we are making any mistakes. That's one. For two, uh, I do this a lot when I'm writing this question. I don't wanna do the algebra. I, I, I know how to do it. And it, so, uh, so I want to show you one tool that can help you cut down on this, um, what can, become tedious. So it's only a tedious work if you know how to do it. So please do learn how to do it. Um, and uh, while you're learning how to do it, it's good to, it, it's beneficial to be able to kind of look up the answer. So now this is something that's uh, available to you only for homework. So because for the exams, you will need to be able to do this by hand. That's why I keep saying to learn how to do this by hand. But while you're working on homework, let me show you one tool you can use to kind of um, help you check your answer to minimize the unnecessary frustration. So 
this is a free version of what is available um, uh, on something called Mathematica or Ulf, you might have seen it as Ulfram Alpha. So um, this is a kind of free version of that. It's called, uh, it's co the software is called a Sage Math. And there are different ways of getting at it. This particular website, sagecell.sagemath.org is the kind of least uh, hassle way of getting at it. I also have Sage installed on my computer, which I could have used it to demonstrate, but um, most people don't have, uh, you know, if you have to install something on your computer, then it becomes very tedious. So let me not do that. So uh, there's a function in Sage called solve. Uh, so let me just show you, help solve. Um, so so the, 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 that's the help file, um, tells you how to use solve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this computer algebra system to just uh, have it solve this system of equations for me. So, um, so I read up on the syntax earlier so that I can do this now. Now I need to define the variables. So I think I had the syntax here bar, okay. That's the, so I need to define my one, two, three, four, five, six variables um, that those are M1, M2, V1, V2, VF1, VF2. Those are bars, bar or bars, I keep forgetting, <laughs> bar, okay. Um, M1, I don't know why this is necessary. It, uh, I, I don't know Sage all that well. I used the Mathematica for a lot longer, so I know Mathematica better, but this is free, <laughs> um, free forever. Okay, so those will define these symbols as variables so that program won't get confused. Now what I need is to specify uh, this solve expression. It kind of works this way. This uh, expression here defines the system of uh, equations you're trying to solve. And these are the variables you're trying to solve for. So let me write it down. Solve. My first equation is the, well, first equation. Uh, M1 times V1 plus M2 times V2 is equal to, I need a two equal signs. That's, it's an assignment versus a comparison operator. Let me not get into that. <laughs> M1 times V final one plus M2 times V final two. And that's my first equation. I need my second equation, uh, m1 times v1 squared plus m2 times v2 squared is equal to m1 times v final 1 squared plus m2 times v final 2 squared. All right, that's my system of equations. And I'm solving, wanting to solve it for v final 1 and v final 2. Let's see what it does. Evaluate. And if I were to try to do this by hand, it would have taken me a good, probably 10 minutes, um, especially if I'm talking. If I'm just writing as quickly as I can, I might do it faster, but if I'm talking, I'm gonna take at least 10 minutes. This did a lot more quickly. It took me more of time talking. Um, now, it gives you more than one set of solutions. And the first solution probably has you going, oh, duh. <laughs> duh in the sense of if these two um, cards kind of just, uh, um, they kind of just uh, missed each other, as in the, the trailing card just uh, went past the leading card, then all right, that's still an interaction that conserves momentum and energy. So the mathematical solution includes that possibility which we are going to ignore. We're not looking for that. We did say they collided. So this is the answer that we are looking for. Um, this is the expression for the, um, the, the final velocity of the originally leading card. And um, yeah, well, so this complicated expression is it. You can uh, do some sanity checks by imagining what the expression would be like if M1 is equal to M2, and I'll leave you up to that. It'll give you some interesting result that's worth thinking through, see if that makes intuitive sense. But in the general case where M1 and M2 are not the same, well, this is the answer to the how speed of the leading, leading bumper car. 
And this is the answer to speed of the trailing bumper car. And this computer algebra system did it a lot faster than I could do it by hand. And, you know, this is uh, good for kind of looking up an answer that you can refer to in case you are making some trivial algebra mistakes and that's um, preventing you from getting the right answer. 